Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm just trying to use the... Okay. I'm just trying to use this virtual pointer here so the people online can also easily follow. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, thanks of all. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. So my name is Maximilian Beckers. I'm a postdoc in the CAT group at Novartis in Basel. And what we are trying to do uh, in my postdoc project is basically trying to leverage the historical MedCam optimization data. So doing some large scale analysis of all the optimizations that we can access. What can we learn from this? So can we identify patterns and trends? Can we identify limiting factors? And ultimately, can we use this data to get some new insights for early decision making? So to get some predictive models for compound success and you know, to also to score chemical series in general. But to provide you some background, the MedChem optimizations are usually structured using uh, the concept of chemical series, which is so chemical series is usually one or multiple related scaffolds, and during the optimization, the scaffolds are decorated with different substituents in order to improve the you know, overall profile of the compound. Uh, it's quite a subjective concept because the uh, scaffolds are defined by the chemists in the context of the project. And it's even more tricky because for you know, all the projects, we do not have historical records of what or which chemicals used the uh, uh, people have actually used in the, uh, in the respective optimizations. And so we had to retrospectively reconstruct that. So we basically ended up to do some kind of a, a scaffold identification approach. So we're basically clustering the data in smaller and smaller subsets until we uh, can identify meaningful scaff uh, scaffolds in these subsets. And uh, the series are then reconstructed using a substructure matching, basically assigning all compounds to a scaffold if it contains the respective scaffold as a substructure. And we did them some more post processing, but in the end, this allowed us to reconstruct more than 3,000 uh, chemical series in general. And then we traced over time how uh, so we, we could sort the compounds according to the first registration dates, and then basically traced over time how certain properties are evolving. Uh, this showed that uh, structures usually tend to get larger, more complex, and less aromatic. So we see here there's a clear increase in FSP3, quite a steep increase in aromaticity. Upnet usually tends to improve, like for example, solubility, but also for clearance and uh, other safety uh, assays. What usually gets worse is permeability, which we could uh, find for both the log pumper as well as the LEMDCK assay. And we could attribute this actually to the, to the increase in heavy atom uh, count that we observed. On the potency side, structures tend to become more active on the target. Uh, lipophilic efficiency tends to increase while the ligand efficiency itself tends to decrease. Again, this is because the structures tend to become bigger over time. But what I want to show you now a bit more is how we use this data now to, to get some predictive models for compound success. So that's, uh, that's basically unpublished data. So I would just ask you not to, to make any pictures. You can make pictures, but not to share them in social media or anywhere else. So what is a successful compound? So we know a compound should be efficacious and non-toxic. This is related to the upward properties as well as the target activities in human. Uh, however, what is a good admit profile? So there are different properties like clearance, permeability, and uh, there's not a unique good admit profile. So we somehow have to judge this. It's even more tricky because at the beginning of a project, we usually only have available in vitro readouts, either measured or uh, sometimes uh, at the design stage, at uh, design stage only uh, predicted. And uh, these in vitro readouts are not always very correlated with the final in vivo outcomes. And the goal that we wanted to achieve here is to get kind of a, a prediction of the long-term success of the compound. And we're trying to do this by connecting the predicted uh, upnet profile to this long-term success of the compound. Uh, but what is yeah, now this long-term success? What we uh, basically uh, try to measure success here is uh, with a developability uh, like measure. So we're basically saying that a compound that is progressing further in our in-house pipeline is better. It uh, makes sense because these compounds uh, are prior to the different steps, right? So first compounds are characterized with in vitro admit, the good ones progress further to in vivo PK, the, the good ones there go further to a DIF dots, which is our internal CSS, uh, CSP endpoint, then they progress towards a, becoming a development candidate. And ultimately, some compounds even reach the clinic in the end. And we're using this now to, to score compounds in the following way. So we start with the uh, just a, a smile representation of the compound. And for this compound, we then predict the admit in vivo PK and safety profile. So for this, we're using global internal models, but also the very recently uh, released melody models. And it's important to mention, we're not using any measured data. It's only predictions because we want to have a model that works at a design stage itself. And we're not using any target activities. So we're 
trying to exclude all project specific information and how to make sure that we have a model that works on as many uh, projects as possible. And then we train the neural network using this historical milestone data. So we have annotated for all compounds in our uh, internal data how far they progressed, what was the terminal stage they reached in development. And this neural network then gives you as an output uh, the, but this neural network learns to connect the predicted output profile to this long term success. And as output, you get a score that somehow estimates the potential of this compound to progress beyond in the VPK studies. And that's why we call the score the VPK score, where VPK stands for beyond PK. Here's a bit more detailed overview of what we're doing. So we take this mass, we predict the upper profile, then we have here a simple MLP. It's quite deep, so seven layers, so fully connected layers. And as last step, we do a rank consistent ordinary regression, which gives us an output for each of the milestones that we have annotated, the likelihood that this compound will progress beyond this milestone. And the output in the end is only the, uh, the second one, which is the transition beyond the PK, which is then our beyond PK score. You see an overview of all the assays that we are predicting. So we're looking at solubility, permeability, some in vivo PK uh, assays like clearance and bioavailability, uh, lots of clearance related endpoints, and quite some safety assays like, for example, phosphate diesterase inhibition, as well as uh, COX1 and COX2. The training data set uh, was composed out of all compounds internally that ever went into the clinic, all development candidates, all compounds that went into DRF talks, all compounds that went into in vivo PK studies, and then a set of 20,000 decoys, so to say, uh, the sort of compounds that were only characterized for in vitro upnet. The model was trained from 2006 into uh, 2016, and then we used the, the training data since, uh, the data since 2017 as test data. And then it just showed that this model did actually a surprisingly good job in predicting the development candidates in our internal test data. So looking here at the rock types, we see that there is a steep increase of uh, true positive ratio, false positive ratio is still rather low, and uh, reaching an AUC here of 0 0.83. We also have a VP phase for model that additionally includes the activities, which uh, yielded an even higher uh, AUC of close to 0 0.9. Comparison to other scoring techniques, like for example, the QED scoring, FSP3, or some other deep learning based approaches like deep, DNA, uh, deep DL or GCN, we, we see here that they basically just follow the diagonal, which means they do a random guessing of compounds. So they do not have any predictive power here anymore. And this also just shows how, how difficult this data is in the end that we are dealing here in, uh, in this uh, MedChem optimizations. And here you have an overview of the BPK score of compounds that progressed beyond in vivo PK studies shown in orange and compounds that did not, which are shown in blue here. And we see here that there is a clear separation between the two populations, but there's still quite an overlap, which is expected though, because uh, once you have found a development candidate, the chemists will make very close neighbors of this compound as well. In order to see can they get better, but that does not mean that this compound uh, does not have the, the potential to be a development candidate. Uh, so here's the basically just uh, a few box plots where you can see again the BPK score for compounds in this class. Zero is not progressed beyond uh, in UPK studies, and one is they progress beyond in UPK studies. And you see there's a clear separation, which is not uh, apparent for the other scoring techniques that we have evaluated here. But no, the BPK score model in the, as input, it only takes the predicted upnet profile. So it makes it actually quite interpretable. So we try to do both uh, explainable AI using Shetley values, but we just wanted to see it, what essays is the model actually looking mainly at. We see that the results mainly agree with how chemists would actually judge the, comp uh, judge the compound. So the most important is bioavailability. And in the top features, we see lots of clearance related endpoints, vulnerability, solubility, and uh, quite some safety related uh, essays. So overall, it's just made us confident that the model seems to look at the compound similar to how chemists would do it, and it seems not to be heavily overfitting. Now, what we also did here is we tried to uh, we did the humor embedding of our internal test set uh, based on the predicted upnet features. So we see here compounds that are close to each other have a similar predicted upnet profile, and then we just colored this here according to the uh, BPK score. What we can see here is there's not just a unique single good upnet profile. So we see there are quite some regions that actually Deliver DCs, which are shown in black, and uh, yeah, red means a high BPK score. And if you look closer, you can also see that sometimes it's a bit complicated to have high BPK score regions, but if you go a bit out, you can see that the model already uh, charges this as badly. So the model itself seems to be quite uh, adaptive towards the, the admit input. Uh, yeah, here's just the same way where I didn't color the uh, with them better. Mm -hmm. Based on the predicted upper properties, and we see that we can find, for example, DCs in high solubility regions, but 
medium permeability, but also in regions where permeability is pretty high and uh, solubility is uh, not so high. Yes, one uh, caveat that remains at this point here is that uh, using so the, the predictive models that we're using might have seen some of the test data already because the models might have been trained on, on data that came more recently. So this one we created here uh, in a data set of public compounds, uh, which should resemble the structure of in-house archive with a kind of a compound in-house archive that you would uh, base in a big pharma company. We uh, extracted the compounds from Campbell where we uh, extract, uh, started with all clinical uh, candidates that we found which delivers us the development candidates. Then we went back into the original publication where this compound appeared for the first time, which delivers us the chemical series of this, this compound. And then we added uh, a set of, uh, wanted to have a set of unsuccessful chemical series. Therefore we expected uh, all other compounds that uh, appeared in JMAC and papers, which corresponded to drug discovery projects, which we did by basically setting just a, a size limit for the number of compounds that are allowed to appear in such a paper. Uh, and this delivered us here a data set of 150,000 compounds, which is between 2010 and 2021. You can see comparing the nearest neighbor distributions that the internal to the, uh, the internal test sets to these public test sets, they're actually quite dissimilar, which makes it pretty uh, suitable for evaluating how good our model is generalizing. The application of the BPK score uh, to this uh, Campbell data set showed that pretty similar results to what we have seen on the internal test data. So we see here again this pretty well uh, behaved drop tag. And AUC, uh, again, close to 0 0.8, in this case 0 0.79, which is only just slightly lower than what we have seen for the internal test data, which was 0 0.83. Again, what we can also see here is that these other scoring techniques that do not really do anything. So let's just, just follow the diagonal, which means they do a random guessing of compounds. We also made us confident here that this data set that we have here actually behaves pretty similar to our internal data. And looking at the histograms, we also see the same as we have seen internally, clear separation of the two populations with still some overlap, which is expected because once you have found a clinical compound, you will find some very close neighbors in these papers as well, which will be very good compounds. We also wanted to see how, how much does this BPK score actually capture. So we wanted to see do compounds in, in other clinical phases have higher BPK scores than compounds that paid in early clinical phases, but this seems to be not to be the case. So uh, the main separation we find between non-clinical compounds and compounds that went into the clinic, which also makes sense because this brain in the clinic won't be related to other properties, but more to, uh, because of complex biology. Also looking at the uh, trends over time, we cannot see that there is actually some something clear happening. So uh, we always see to, from 2010 to 2020, uh, we can see that there is always a clear separation between clinical candidates and non-clinical candidates, but overall it seems to be quite a stable pattern, which is also expected. I mean, these admin properties, which in the end it should be somehow related to the bioavailability in, uh, in human. But we also explore from alternative machine learning models. So first we try to reduce the number of predicted admit endpoints. And uh, what this showed us is that we can get rid of the safety assay predictions. We can also exclude DPK endpoint predictions. Even if we go only with the melody predictions from admit, we still uh, reach an ASC here of close to 0 0.8. Uh, what did not work so well was only using the internal admit models, but this is mainly related because um, it's mainly classification models and the admit models that we, uh, the melody models that we use for uh, regression models, but this admit, uh, internal admit models, it's, the, the output from this classification uh, models is the surface probabilities and they just do not care, uh, have the same amount of uh, quantitative information as uh, final regression models. Then we also try to include not only the applet, but also the, the structural features. But um, so here going with the partner network where we encode and the graphing, uh, concatenate the graphing coding together with the 2D feature uh, uh, descriptors from RD kit and the predicted admit. But in the end, this model then so internally slightly better performance, but in the public test data set, the performance actually dropped quite a low down to 0 0.74. It's probably some overfitting on internal structures. Uh, yeah, we also uh, went with the more simple model, which is an XC boost in this case. It worked pretty well on the internal data, but again, when the external data performance dropped and uh, seems to be related to the overfitting because the best model that we got already had a depth of one if we would Try to find overfitting even more and reduce the depth even more, and the model would just disappear basically. 
So uh, that's also the, all this, these explorations have showed us that the main uh, issue that we are facing in training the model is the overfitting because there's not the data that is just not so big. Uh, a last source of train test we get that we evaluated is uh, from the melody models because the melody models they were trained also with data from other pharma companies and we wanted to make sure uh, and these compounds could appear in our public test data sets. So we wanted to make sure that this is not an issue. And that we uh, basically started a, a testing strategy they have uh, used in Melody, uh, which was a scaffold-based train test split. So in our public test data set, we annotated all compounds that would have fallen in the in the test data set of the Melody phase two models, which were evaluated. And then we just took these compounds, replaced the Melody models with the Melody phase two models, and uh, we did the analysis. And this revealed uh, that there is not much happening. So we're in here looking at the on the BP phase score model that only uses the ADNET predictors for melody, the AUC is only slightly dropping, dropping from 0 0.82 uh, to 0 0.8, which is probably not even statistically significant, but this drop can also just be explained by the fact that the melody phase two models here might just have not seen as much data as the final melody models. Yes, and I want to show you just some first applications of the PP phase code that we have explored internally. And the first one was uh, tracking the, the progress projects are making. So we reached out here to several projects that had recently delivered a development candidate. We also wanted to see how well the ground model perform inside individual projects. And does it also make sense in, does it agree with what the chemists had, had seen? And so I extracted our compounds that I've made in the project and uh, annotated them to different chemical series here, and then just, uh, uh, just scored them. What we can see here that the score actually allows already quite some nice uh, uh, distinction between the uh, chemical series, so it would actually also allow you to prioritize one scaffold over another. What we can see here is that the uh, DC scored amongst the top compounds, and looking at the traces over time, we can also see that the BP phase score actually nicely captures how the compounds tend to improve for this one chemical series three, so the, that also agreed with uh, the impression of the chemist. They said that the series basically constantly delivered new front runners until they have found the development kind of that. Uh, for this project two here, we saw basically the same result. Uh, the development candidate has scored amongst the top compounds. And uh, the traces over time actually had a pretty interesting uh, behavior here. So we see that there was not much progress here for almost more than 1,000 compounds until they suddenly found a modification to the scaffold, which resolved most of the system issues which then delivered the development candidates. Project three was a bit more tricky because they had delivered two development candidates, one a bit worse according to the BP case code than the other, which made sense in the end because uh, the first one here was a topical uh, DC and topical compounds just have less uh, requirements with respect to the overall argument because they often have very high clearance. Looking at the traces over time, we can also see here again that the code score actually nicely captures how the, the compounds tend to improve until the DC was delivered the first one and then the second one. Of course, ultimately, uh, what we want to use this score for is uh, to basically fish out the, the good compounds in large amounts of in silico uh, generated virtual compounds. And the first example in this uh, direction uh, we explored was in doing a, a scaffold prioritization, basically. So we took it from a, just a published uh, factor to an A project, uh, three scaffolds. And uh, the scaffolds are quite highly related and both had, uh, all had two exit vectors. And then we just enumerated around this exit vector. So we generated lots of compounds, scored them, and wanted to see, okay, which scaffold is now more promising. This showed us that uh, looking at the fraction of compounds that actually have DC like properties, that the scaffold two here has almost a twice as highly, uh, twice as uh, high probability to deliver a development candidate compared to scaffold one, but also slightly higher than scaffold three. Uh, structurally, that also makes sense because scaffold one here has a free amide bond, which is not really desired. Scaffold and scaffold two has a slightly higher FSP3 than uh, scaffold uh, three. In the end, it also agreed with the result of the project because the, the final DC here was delivered by scaffold two. The in house, we also explored basically doing the same. And uh, usually, what we see here that even in the case of very related scaffolds, we can find some differences and prioritize one scaffold over another. And of course, one nice gimmick of doing such, uh, uh, such a thing is that you can just look at the compounds here that score very well and see which modifications they are actually uh, useful to pursue in your project then. 
Uh, yes, of course, a few challenges remain. That's largely related to the structure of our internal training data. So there's a, a huge oral bias. The, com the BPK score will, uh, scores are highest for uh, orally available compounds. And if you have a topical compound, it's probably below it because you might just have some additional clashes in some admin properties, like, for example, clearance. Uh, we're missing project specific information. So, like, if you have special mode of actions for relation to specificity, you usually incorporate this. Then, yeah. we just uh, incorporated uh, this additional project specific in, uh, project specific information. Then, by filtering for some other properties, like for example, if you have predictions for an off-target essay, you can just filter data, your data additionally with this and the BPK score. Applicability domain: uh, the uh, SBR training only until two thousand and sixteen. New modalities like protex, covalent inhibitors, and also radio ligands are pretty rare in there. So we do not really know how the BPK score will work on this, but as long as the uplift properties are predicted properly for these compounds, the BPK score should give you uh, reasonable results as well. So we do not think that this is a major issue here. Of course, yeah, one of the, these false negatives make the training pretty hard because we have many compounds that have DC-like properties, which were just uh, never. Uh, nominated as a development candidate, but you know, it's, it's hard to do. You cannot really change this labeling because it would mean you would have to put so many uh, additional compounds into high uh, complex talk studies, but it would be ethically with all these animal experiments, but also economically pretty challenging. But it's just something that we have to take care of then during the training. Yes, with this, I'm already finished with my presentation. I just want to thank all the people that were involved in this project so far, especially Nick and Nico. For the great supervision, also the other co authors, Finton and Noe, for lots of help. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Questions? Okay, I go first this way. Thank you very much for this great talk. Um, I have two questions, maybe just uh, just a few for my understanding. Uh, so the first one is when you did your series definitions, you did it in an automatic fashion. Yeah. Did you analyze um, how how much is that in line with uh, the series definition of the corresponding synthetic chemists? Because and if it does not correspond, or sometimes or some some there are some deviations, is it really of importance? So basically, would you have you gotten the same result if you would have just followed? you know, the series definition by the medicinal chemists. Yeah, we actually did this uh, because we, at least for newer projects, we have these annotations and usually it does agree very well, but it also depends how the chemists handle it. Some chemists are very careful doing, saying, okay, there's one series, this is one scaffold, but sometimes it's just super generic scaffolds with seven exit vectors and that's when it, of course, disagrees. Then we, we just split up the series they had into multiple series. Okay, and my second question, um, when you did your training of your of your mod, then the series information did not was not taken into account. So you basically mixed all the compounds in in pools, respectively of the of the scaffolds. Exactly. So we tried to make sure to only uh, use the good compounds. So the trade the, the data set is already very challenging. So it's just a set of twenty thousand random comp uh, random compounds that went into in vitro admit, and all the other compounds is all compounds that went into further top studies. Okay. And then maybe a last comment. Your slides at the end show very nicely that how difficult it is sometimes to stop projects or to finish exactly. projects. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's also one of the often the question came, can it be used to terminate projects? But if you look at this one trace where you have no progress and suddenly this peak, it's just yeah. Thanks, Max. Yeah. I just wondering, and maybe I missed this. Do you when you're doing a forward when you're doing a prediction, do you take into account where in the project timeline the compound is? Because I imagine at the very start, having poor ADME might be okay because you've time to get rid of it. If you're two years or a year and a half in and you have poor ADME, that's not so good. You mean in these traces here? Yeah? Uh, sorry? Do you mean in these traces here where I'm taking account D? Uh, perhaps so, yeah. Well, just, just when you're doing a prediction yeah. of whether you're going to have a successful compound, where in the project you are, it's going to influence whether you're going to be successful. But the, the model itself is not including this information. It's basically just predicting, taking a compound, predicting the admit profile, and then judging this admit profile, how successful this compound is potentially. Okay. So that's, in the end, it would be to the chemists to, to basically judge this. If they are at a very early stage where they're mainly focusing on target activity, then 
they might just ignore it with a score to try to gain more SAR knowledge, basically. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was wondering how do you solve the concentration compound concentration issue because different compound uh, at different compound concentration compounds at different concentration can give different bioactivity. Um, how do you deal with this? Do you fix the concentration or do you take everything into account? And we're actually not including any uh, target activities. There is no potency data in the model included, so it only judges the upnet properties. But, but, is it, but is it, that's a problem then, because uh, compounds that, again, that's not like I'm repeating, like don't, don't compounds at different concentration will give different bioactivity. So, um... well, the model showed just that in the end, you don't need a lot of this information for the target activity. What it probably does is kind of doing a dose uh, prediction. So it tries to, okay, it assumes that this compound, let's assume that this compound is somehow active. What is the predicted human dose that you would uh, have to go? Is, this a, is the dose in a reasonable range? Okay. This is someone answer your question. I hope. Okay, there's maybe discussion in the break. Now I will go to the other side. And that will be our last question. And then we go to the coffee. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, one technical question to the melody prediction. Uh, I assume you have a lot of tasks in this multitask model. Or well, probably I know this. It was also involved in the project. Um, did you filter the um, yeah the predictions by their individual performance? So you mentioned that you used regression the regression model. Um, does this impact, so to say, your feature selection for your training, or did you just take every prediction which you get, even though the no. yeah, evaluation score is rather low? So we basically started with going with uh, admin properties, basic admin properties like permeability, clearance, and so on. Then the PK, in vivo PK uh, assets, which were a few in our case, and safety endpoints. Uh, the safety endpoints don't have much data involved. So we actually had a look at this performance that probably also explains, I mean, I have this one plot uh, where we explored uh, what happens if we get rid of some of the melody models. And it's just so that if we go with these admin melody models, we almost gain all the performance. Which also makes sense, right? Because these other models, they, it's not enough data that, for them to generalize pretty well. It's, yeah, but this worked actually pretty well, these models that we have. So that's the standard admin is where we have lots of data. Okay. Greg wants a very quick question in. Bigger plots? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Bigger plots would be nice. I'm oh, um, sorry. The light ends on the plots would be. Anyway. Um, the question is, or the, the suggestion, I think it would be really interesting to take your predictor and the data set you use to train it on and do a match pair analysis. Um, so find molecules which have a single or a small structural differences with very large predicted yeah. um, developability differences and see if there's any signal there. I think, it, I think that would just be a really interesting analysis. Yeah, have, have you done it already? No, not yet. Okay. We, we, we trust you. I don't, I mean, I, yes, I want to make your to-do list longer. I think it would be a really cool analysis. It's a definitely interesting point because we also have some, often they're very late compounds, but just some of them have tendency cliffs, which just makes it better. And since you don't have a 